we're going to take you on a wild ride behind the green curtain and we'll tell you things about this world of ours that you have never heard before. But first up tonight, the idea of a single all-powerful group of people who actually control and manipulate much of the world as we know it seems so fantastic to many Americans that they literally laugh it off. Unfortunately, according to England's most controversial author, David Icke, it is anything but a laughing matter. David Icke is about to start a major speaking tour of the United States promoting his new book entitled And the Truth Shall Set You Free, which has already been labeled by some international book reviews as, quoting now, the most explosive book of the 20th century because of the scope of revelations contained in it. David Icke has exposed the intricate web of control, artifice, and financial enslavement that is being used by the unelected global elite who own or control the major world banks, the multinational companies, the drug companies, the world media, the armament companies, the world market in hard drugs, the military, and the basic institutions of what we think of as freely elected governments. David Icke is a dangerously well-informed journalist, and he joins us now from near our nation's capital in Arlington, Virginia. Hello, David. Are you there? Hi, Jeff. Good evening. Good evening to you, sir. Why, David, is it so hard, and you've been doing this a number of years now, why is it so hard for the average American to understand that we are, in fact, being managed and manipulated by a relatively few super-powerful individuals and multinational companies? Why is that such a hard thing to grasp? Well, I think in the end, Jeff, it's numbers. Uh, people look at, uh, what, five and a half billion people in the world, and they think, well, a few cannot control that many people. It's ridiculous. And mm -hmm. if you're talking about um, controlling them physically, then that's obviously true, but it's not done physically. It's done by what I call a coup d'etat on the mind. Yes, It's yes. by um, conditioning people. Um, to think the way you want them to think. And there are many techniques we can talk about in the way it's done daily. Mm -hmm. And also, preferably, getting people not to think at all. Um, and if you can get uh, people who are unique individuals in truth to uh, so uh, concede that individuality of thought and uh, behavior and uh, expression to the point where we become a herd or a bewildered herd, as the human race has largely allowed itself to become, that it, then suddenly we're into the area of uh, a few being able to control the world. I was um, in Wiltshire, not far from where I live, a couple of years ago in England, and uh, I was on this uh, big hillside, and there were hundreds of sheep across the hillside. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just enjoying the day, nice sunny day, and mm -hmm. um, along came the farmer in this pickup truck, parked it, got out, stood on his stick and virtually did nothing else. He just stood there. Yes. The moment he did that, one or two of the three of the sheep started to move in a certain direction, almost uh, by a trigger. It's obviously happened every day. Mm -hmm. Within minutes, I was looking at Exodus uh, with hundreds of sheep following these two or three that started the, uh, started the movement. And those few sheep that... Um, didn't immediately conform to that. They were given the extra dose of fear with the sheepdog. And in minutes, this combination of the bar-bar mentality, as I call it, just <laughs> not thinking, just taking what right. you're told to be true, yes. and the fear mentality, which um, keeps a lot of people that know what's going on uh, quiet, that combination had rounded up this herd of sheep uh, in, a, in a few minutes. It was an extraordinary sight. And as I watched that, I realized that it's this combination of the bar-bar mentality and the fear that actually uh, allow the few to control the world. And they do it through the pyramid structure. I mean, uh, the, the, I, I, what I find with people is once they see that it's possible for a few to control the world because of the structure, yes. suddenly uh, they begin to look at the news and see not only is it possible, but it's happening. And just very quickly, if you take the pyramid, um, if every organization in the world today virtually is a pyramid. At the peak, you've got a tiny, tiny few people who know everything there is to know about the organization, its agenda, where it's really going, and what it's really meant to achieve. Mm -hmm. The further you come down from the peak, you're meeting more and more people who know less and less and less about what the organization is really about. They only know their tiny part in it, compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. Exactly, called. sure. And, um, as a, and, and so the bank, every bank is a pyramid, and the banks um, are part of a banking system pyramid 
which has its own peak. The multi at the top of that banking system pyramid, all the major banks are the same organization. Same with the intelligence agencies. At the peak of their pyramid, Mossad is British intelligence, is the CIA, is German intelligence. So it is with the media and the multinational corporations that you know, fuse I... into one pyramid peak of the global pyramid, which encompasses all of these uh, individual pyramids. And uh, up there, there's maybe, I don't know, it's speculated largely of around uh, 13 families, 13 people ahead yes. of those families that actually yes, run exactly. the whole shebang and, and yes. pervade down the pyramid uh, the policy that's pushing us further and further towards centralization of global power. I like what you said earlier, uh, to condition them not to think at all. And that's really the, the big illusion here, is to give people the physical freedom and yet take away their active thought processes by keeping them anesthetized with media with drugs, with toys, with diversions, to Diversion, condition them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in in um, And the Truth Shall Set You Free, I'm just trying to find it now, I quote from an, another author um, right at the start, which sums up what you're saying absolutely brilliantly. It's uh, for a quote from Michael Timothy and the anti-intellectual uh, intellectual ethic. It says, we are actively discouraged from thinking constructively and questioningly. And once an individual has accepted the numb acquiescence so encouraged, an insidiously vicious circle has successfully been promoted. This is the key line. Another rather convenient result of such a situation is that people who don't think constructively and questioningly don't even realize that <laughs> they don't. It's um, amen. And yeah, I meet a lot right. of people who think that they're streetwise around the, about the world, and they think because they work in universities and they... Mm -hmm work in the intellectual areas, they must know what's going on. Well, if yes. they work in the universities, they're going to be the last people to know what's going on. Isn't keeping that the that truth? knowledge out of the public arena is fundamental to this yeah. control. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, we have some organizations that uh, are, are bandied about the alternative media quite a bit. Uh, a lot of Americans who endeavor to become informed, which unfortunately isn't a large enough segment yet of this society, but we've heard of the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateralists and all of that. Uh, the mainstream media, of course, if it ever does mention those groups, dismisses them as some sort of men's social club. Uh, in, in point of fact, these are three of the major arms of this global elite that does administer much, at least, at the very least, David, sets the tone of the basic uh, tenor of our lives. Now, let's talk about these three groups, and then we're going to talk a little bit about secret societies. I want to okay. set up the power structure. As well, though, because I don't want to leave Britain out of this, because the, Britain has been manipulating uh, the human race uh, well before the United States was even formed. There's one called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which is the uh, British version of the Council on Foreign Relations. They're actually the same organization all of these groups are. They've just got different names on the shop front. Yes, the RIIA. Uh, yeah. You know, you're right. We Americans tend to look at Britons with uh, with respect for this reserved civility when in point of fact, and you're not the first to say it, the British have been uh, with a capital R, ruthless in wow. their domination. Have, have they just, yeah. Ruthless. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's take these groups, uh, if we can, David Ike, uh, one by one, and just uh, have a little fun with uh, ask, saying who they are, what they are, and when they were set up. Let's start out with uh, the Bilderberg Group. Well, the, 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 what, uh, what these groups started out from was um, a, a secret society set up in Britain in the, here we go, Britain again, mm -hmm. latter part of the last century, early part of this century, uh, called yes. the Round Table, which was uh, structured on Masonic lines. It involved a guy called uh, Cecil Rhodes, after whom uh, Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, was named. And, uh, Mr. Cecil One Rhodes World, And yeah. uh, another guy called um, uh, Alfred Milner, a banker linked mm -hmm. to the House of Rothschild. Uh, mm -hmm. This little lot were involved in uh, the Boer Wars in South Africa when a guy called Lord Kitchener, who's very famous uh, in, uh, in Brit British history... He's um, a butcher, wasn't he? ...set up he? the first concentration camps. Yes. I mean, uh, the, the, the yes. idea that yes. Hitler yes. set up the first concentration camps... Yeah. The British showed him how to do it in South Africa. Exactly. You know? um, and uh, in interestingly, uh, Cecil Rhodes, when he was uh, when he died, he he he, he uh, bequeathed a lot of funds to this Round Table, from which all these organisations you mentioned were spawned. Um, and some of his money was to set up um, something called Rhodes Scholarships at Oxford University, where people, uh, students would be brought from around the world, um, uh, selected, highly selected uh, people, um, who later, amazingly, what a coincidence, end up in positions of power in the world. And, of course, the most famous Rhodes Scholar in America currently is uh, Bill Clinton. Yes, and it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with intellectual prowess, does it? No, I think that's fair to say, Jeff, yeah. <laughs> that's fair to say that. Um, the Bilderberg Group was the, the third in this um, 
organized, list of organizations. The first one was the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs. What happened was that this, the, the um, British elite members of the Round Table, they met at uh, the Hotel Majestic in Paris in 1919 while the uh, Versailles Peace Conference was going on after the First World War. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. elite British members of the Round Table just happened to be, nothing to worry about, the uh, major players in the British War Cabinet during the First World War. <laughs> and they met with the American elite members of this Round Table, which just happened to be the American uh, key members in the American administration during the uh, First World War, the Wilson administration, particularly yes. a guy called Edward Mandel House, who was serious, serious manipulator in this country on behalf of this lot. Mm -hmm. And they decided they were going to set up um, offshoot organizations around this central core round table secret society that would um, push on this plan of creating world government, world central bank, world army, and uh, world currency. Yeah, enforcement. And what have you. The enforcement, so to speak. Yeah, uh, manipulating uh, yeah. us towards more and more centralization of power sure. by creating events and then offering the solutions to them, basically. And um, the Royal Institute of International Affairs was the first one that was set up in 1920 in London. And uh, just as, you know, you, you walk down the high street, you see loads and loads of uh, different names over the shops. But when you look at it, actually, it's... Um, uh, the same very few organizations own the lot. So these organizations I'm talking about now are actually the same force with different names. Mm -hmm. In 1921 came the American version of the Royal Institute, and that was the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, the Rockefeller Empire are, are fundamentally involved on the American side uh, in this. And um, the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs, its main role, is to manipulate British domestic, but particularly foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And the Council on Foreign Relations is there to do the same in the United States. Okay, we're going to have to take our first break, uh, David, coming up on that very quickly. Let me just recap what we've done so far. We've talked about the Roundtable Secret Society that really uh, came into its own power-wise after the First World War. Uh, that organization then spawned a number of other organizations, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, RIIA, then the Bilderberg Group, the CFR, which we've just talked about, the Council on Foreign Relations, and we'll talk about the Trilateral Commission as we continue here with Britain's most controversial author, David Icke, who is laying out for all of us tonight his view of how this world of ours is controlled and manipulated by a global elite, a very important program tonight for you. David Icke is now detailing how the world structure of power is uh, has been set up over the last 70, 80 years. We started out with the Secret Society of the Roundtable, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and then the executive arms, if you will, of the RIIA, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergers, the Council on Foreign Relations, and I guess underneath those, David, would be the U.S. government, wouldn't it, <laughs> at that point? Yeah, certainly. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations was set up in 1921, and since that time, every president of the United States, bar Ronald Reagan, as I understand it, but he wasn't actually president, George Bush was. George Bush was the first president to have three terms in office, in truth, if not in official reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone but Reagan since 1921, when he was set up, has been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. You can't get into the major posts, in uh, some of the major posts in America, without being in the Council on Foreign Relations, like yes. uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, is a member of the CFR, and so is the stream of his predecessors. And then... After that was set up, um, along came the Bilderberg Group, which I think is the most influential uh, at the moment. Um, and, of course, um, uh, that again involves, like all these other uh, groups, the, the major people in positions of power in the world. These groups are used higher up the pyramid mm -hmm. that I talked about earlier yes. by the people in that peak to actually put their representatives or their stooges um, front men into these positions of power. For instance, the Bilderberg Group uh, was set up in '54. Its first uh -huh. chairman was Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who was a member of the SS before the war. According to many published works, worked for German intelligence during the war and then became a major shareholder of Shell Oil after the war. Hold on, David. We have to take a little pause here. Uh, so the Bilderberg Group, founded in 1954, uh, amazing succession of, of uh, power agencies put together by this original group? Well, actually, it was a, um, a, um, a European stroke American um, operation. Mm -hmm. um, the, what I've exposed uh, in great detail in And the Truth Shall Set You Free is how the European uh, 
community, which became, uh, of course, the European Union now effectively a centralized super state um, in Europe, uh, was actually um, set up uh, partly from America with great American influence um, and tremendous British influence as usual as well. And the people that set up the European uh, community, which was there and as it's turned out to centralize power in Europe politically, economically and on all the other levels, um, there was a guy called Joseph Rettinger who worked with um, uh, Prince Bernhard to set up the Bilderberg Group, and uh, he was a fundamental force. Indeed, this is this is um, accepted in uh, conventional versions of history. He was a, a fundamental force in setting up the European Community. So effectively, the same people did both the Bilderberg Group and the European Community. And the uh, manipulation of European governments to um, uh, form this. It is a super state now. I mean, yes. I, I come from Britain. I see it all the time. Oh, European yes. law overrides um, British law. Really? Um, and um, uh, when the central bank in Europe comes into uh, fruition and the currency, single currency, we've already signed something called the Maastricht Treaty. This is not for negotiation. We signed this. It means that all the gold uh, and currency reserves of the, the, the nation states of the European Union leave those countries and go to the central bank in Frankfurt. Wow. And there is absolutely nothing in the Maastricht Treaty to um, get those assets back if a country wants to pull out. Mm -hmm. And also, again, it's in the Maastricht Treaty that the central bank will be run by eight, uh, sorry, six unelected bankers <laughs> with an eight-year guaranteed period of tenure. And it's actually in the treaty that no other area of the community, including the elected part, shall influence or override the decisions of those bankers. Wow. And it, it's kind of funny, you know. Um, yeah. uh, I, 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 a friend from Germany um, was telling me that Adolf Hitler had a design, an economic design for Europe, had he won the last war. And it's a very long German name, but it translates into English as the European Economic Community. So... Um, he got he got what he wanted, even though he were, he didn't win the war, because that's hmm. exactly what's happening now. Far from a uh, yeah. And the Bilderberg Group, which is where uh, the uh, relevance of that group comes in in terms of this European Union, yes. has been um, manipulating that situation um, since its formation in 